So again, we're meeting after a while since our last last talk. And today we have a very special guest, guys. So let me introduce you to Sara, Sara Mikhail. She's my longtime friend. And you see, we, we share the same interests. We lost we, we, we share the same passions. So today I'm really delighted to, to start sitting around this virtual table and start talking about, see, the topics that we, we, we care about. So I'll let Sarah introduce herself. Sarah, stay today is yours. So I'll let it to you to, to tell us who you are, what you're doing, what your background is, and what your expertise is. So we start chatting like this. Okay. Welcome, by That's the way, to Sergio. Prego. Benvenuta. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so hello, Andrea. Hi, Bob and Eric. Thank you so much for having me on this uh, you know, forum. I've, I've been a fan of, of what you do, and I always like to uh, listen to these sessions. So it's quite an honor to be here myself, uh, getting my turn this, this time around. So just to quickly introduce myself to, to the audience. Um, so I'm Sarah Mikhail. I'm, I'm born and raised in the UAE, but I'm actually uh, Egyptian. I uh, graduated with a double degree from the American University in Cairo uh, in journalism and finance. Uh, journalism was what I started with, uh, and finance happened around my sophomore year when something that was not too known, known as the subprime crisis, happened. Um, and then it just got me curious as to, you know, what's going on, what, what the usual man on the street needs to understand. And that's when I joined uh, Reuters Next, which seemed as the natural progression of my studies, being a financial information and, and newswire company. Uh, but I got more than I bargained for uh, in, in less than a year of joining the uh, Arab Spring happened. So uh, we were very understaffed compared to the news that was happening. Um, so I did find myself going into the political field uh, as well, reporting on happenings in the uh, uh, on location in Tahrir Square, which got very famous worldwide, I'm sure, with all the protests and stuff that happened. Um, and I would say I was probably a cat with nine lives, was it? I think it's nine. So <laughs> gunshots and whatnot. It, it, it so. is, it is, actually. <laughs> I thought it was seven yeah, by nine, so, nine lives. Seven nine lives, was it? Yeah, I can't recall. Yes. Nine lives. <laughs> nine nine lives, lives, yes. So, yeah. um, and then that's when I decided, you know, uh, yeah, enough's enough. I want to go into the financial world. And that's when I was one of 21 people um, who was, uh, you know, very fortunate to be in the Treasury and Trade Solutions MA program in City for all of EMEA. So nice. I went through that, uh, through work. I went through uh, London, Bahrain, uh, in, in UAE, Abu Dhabi, and Dubai. Then I went into uh, uh, relationship management for global subsidiary coverage for the multinationals in the UAE with Deutsche Bank. So I've done that for four and a half years. And then later on went uh, with Natixis, which is a French bank uh, under the second largest banking group called BPCE, like the French called or BPCE. And uh, I was managing uh, trade finance more on the solution side for large corporates of the Middle East. So it was actually the reverse of multinationals, the big large corporates of, of this part of the world. And then um, I embarked to do my uh, master's in blockchain. I was one of the scholarship recipients from Binance because I got a, a little curious and then my curiosity took me into the tech world. So let's say I saw the light. Good, <gasps> good choice and good deal. I mean, yes. especially for yes. the technological world. Sarah, exactly. Uh, so, uh, Oh, sorry. So now I'm in the uh, I'm a global business development manager with uh, Impel, which is uh, well, some people want to call it a layer two of the uh, blockchain, the XDC network, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. So yeah, great, Sarah. Good choice, by the way. So I leave it on. I would love to start from where you ended up, by the way, when you stepped into the blockchain space. Good additions yeah. into this. We started out chats chatting actually end of 2022. Uh, because of the news, you see that we heard uh, the demise, you see of so many ventures, what happened in the past months. So, uh, but we, we, we usually learn good lessons from hard ones. So the spirit is, hey, look at, looking at what's happened so far, let's start brainstorming on what to do next to be successful instead of unsuccessful. So that's the spirit. Mm -hmm. You see, I would love to kickstart the meeting. And again, I leave it on to you to, to give us uh, a picture, in your opinion, what's going on globally with a focus on what's going on in the MENA region. 
to start from Dubai, of course, which is the center of a seismic movement that's going on in the area. Yes, absolutely. Um, so I'll just talk about firstly uh, why why you know trade tech and why technology in general and why did I even you know decide to dip into this uh, you know from very traditional banking background. So essentially, there is a need for trade tech. I know 22, the year 2022 was not the best year probably for trade tech with the demise of some of the famous names that have been in the in the industry for some time, especially on the blockchain and DL, DLT space. But it's it's inevitable for 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 trade tech to to grow within within uh, within the trade finance space. It's not a good to have uh, idea. It's a must have. And I just wanted to show what is the case for for trade tech. So, firstly, it's going to be more inclusive the ecosystem through blockchain and trade tech. It's going to promote the GDP and the economy, which is 90% based from SMEs who are having the short end of the stick in terms of financing right now. So if I talk, for instance, where I'm based in the Middle East, only 7% of all banking fi financing goes to SMEs. That small teardrop in the ocean, that's, that's, that's it. And that's why we keep on talking about that infamous number, that $1.7 trillion trade finance gap since 2020. This is going to continue to be heard, if not a larger number, if we don't shift into new modes of doing business. So if we talk about, okay, SMEs, how could we help them through blockchain or trade tech? Well, you could have real-time credit profiles or cash conversion cycles being shown immutably on the system. And also tapping into other financiers, not just banks, um, as opposed to them struggling right now, not being to able to 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 prove themselves worthy for the for having financing from banks, for instance. Um, the second area to look at is cost and time efficiencies. So um, you would see, for instance, there was a study done by McKinsey that said trade digitization and going into electronic bills of lading, which we'll explain later, could save six point five billion dollars in direct costs. So imagine when you have these banks that have armies of, of staffing for trade operations to look through documentary trade, KYC, which is a, a huge pain point in, in the industry um, to validate counterparties. Imagine taking all of this off and having immutable <clears throat> records, real-time records for everyone, everyone to see. So you can imagine um, how much efficiencies you will get out of this. So in fact, the World Economic Forum estimates that costs could go up, uh, uh, sorry, could go down by a quarter if you involve trade tech and technologies into what you do. So the question I think parties should ask themselves here, and that's everyone, not just banks, it's the whole ecosystem, the maritime industry, everything. Do you wanna be relevant in this coming world that is coming? It's not even tomorrow, it, it, it is coming. Um, Thirdly, it's uh, this is particular to banks and financiers, which is untapping new revenue streams. So we've seen with Basel IV that's uh, around the corner, with balance sheet pressures, with reduced risk appetites from insurance companies, as well as uh, uh, you know risk participating banks, uh, that trade finance now is not getting as much limits as it needs to support again with that trade finance gap. Um, so there is. There are now trade techs involved. One of them is actually called trade tech with a Q in end, not to confuse it with trade tech, the word. Um, it was launched in 2018. It's also based on the same XDC that uh, the company that I work for, Impel, is also based on, which is the XDC network. And the whole idea and forte of this company is to convert trade assets into something that people like you and, um, you and I can invest in. So uh, for something as little as 100 bucks, give or take. Um, so you change the model of trade asset distribution, which is a relatively low risk asset compared to stocks. We see what's going on in the market these days and going into, you know, you're basically investing in the real economy. It's something that you understand. It's, 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 uh, imports and exports. Um, and then, um, uh, what, uh, what happens is that through, through fungible, uh, um, uh, uh, through fungible conversions of this to the investors, retail investors such as ourselves through tokenization, you're creating new investment products for the real economy as well. So this is this is a third point. Uh, fourth is the standardization of electronic bill of lading. So the maritime industry is is picking up 
uh, COVID in a sense was a, a silver lining, a blessing in disguise, if you will, that kind of revealed everywhere in the world that the industry is very vulnerable to paper. And that cannot continue because that becomes a showstopper for the um, for the entire industry. Um, so, a hundred percent of electronic uh, bills, uh, sorry, bills of lading will be electronic by 2030, and they also have a milestone in between. Fifty percent is going to be converted electronic. So, we're talking like the big players like Hapag Lloyd, Maersk, uh, CMA. That, that's CGS, the pledge that was recently launched, by the way, when it's which exactly. is partaken, by the way, by the DCSA. That that's that's a tough one actually. You know, when I saw it, it was oh my goodness by 2030 at the stage where we are now. That's that's gonna be a tough. It's exciting. One. It, it is exciting, it's exciting. And tough at the same time. It, 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 you see, the the tougher it is, the more exciting it gets. At least into my mind. Sorry, Sarah, go, you can go ahead. No, no, sure, absolutely. So, and the other thing that's also picking up is not just the maritime industry, but the most important is regulation and banks will keep on saying regulation, 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 right? So uh, the UK now is looking into legislating a bill called the electronic uh, trade document, which is going to help uh, not just the UK, but I would say other jurisdictions around the world because the majority of commercial contracts are based on English common law. So that's not something that's just going to, it's it's a major paradigm shift not only bringing the industry away from 1800 laws into the 21st century, but actually bringing the globe at large to uh, um, you know, adopt MLETR or the model law for electronic trade records. Um, so that's, that's something that's interesting that's happening. Last but not least, the uh, it topic, if you will, ESG and sustainable trade. So this is a twofold context when we talk about this. Um, we typically hear, oh, there are these banks that have um, sustainable finance uh, agendas. They want to match that with the SDGs. They want to show that they're deploying finance in the right uh, areas. They want to show their entire stakeholders, their customers, their shareholders, etc., that they are sticking to the program of SDG and whatnot. That's one angle of things. But I think what's also very important as an industry that we cannot be hypocritical ourselves look, hunting for these kinds of transactions, but ourselves not being um, ESG friendly. So by um, talking digital, it means we're decarbonizing. And I just want to give a very interesting uh, statistic uh, that was mentioned in, in, in the UK that uh, they did a report that 2.5 million tons of carbon dioxide is emitted in 2018. And that's coming simply from paper and printing in international trade, just that context over there. I, I thank so you so imagine... much for giving this, uh, Sarah, because <laughs> When when I have my chest, so often you see I'm told, "Come on, you see shifting documents. How can this impact you see in the total carbon emissions?" Hey, look at this. Can you imagine? And it's it's pretty easily imaginable because you have sort of think about an LC, think about how yeah. it works, and all the pinpoint of documents. At first, you might think, "Oh, it's not a big deal." It is. Yeah. It is compared to the global volume that's that's also a large portion so reducing and going for digital house putting down that that statistics of course exactly exactly no and it just shows like how much we're actually uh, through operations putting into the air uh so it doesn't make sense that we're supporting a green trade transaction but to support it we're printing and we're using paper and we're actually you know, it's counterintuitive to what we want to do. So I think that's that's one area, which is the E, but we shouldn't forget about the S and G, which is through trade tech, we can monitor um, how suppliers are sourcing things sustainably in an immutable fashion, uh, equitable treatment of women in the workforce. We can also look that there was no uh, child labor or human trafficking that's involved, blood diamonds when it comes to like, you know, like uh, how, how diamonds are sourced, for instance, et cetera. And then um, last but not least, governance. The whole idea that we talk about, the whole double dipping that happens, an invoice that gets used more than once to different financiers. And we have an amazing example here in the UAE, which is called UAE Trade Connect or UTC, which was launched, I believe, in 2021. It involved 10 national uh, banks, as well as uh, one of the main telecom operators, and they actually help SMEs get funded because they are circumventing the fraud that could happen from double dipping in the system. So that's a very good uh, use case. We had the honor Last of but not listening. Least, sorry. 
Yeah. We oh sorry for breaking in. Uh, we had the honor at Hyperledger Trade Finance SIG to hear from uh, Hussein Shakir in the last summer. Mm-hmm. If you remember, Rick, he was with us and in detail what they yes. were doing. And it's great to to understand what's going on in the space. So sorry, sorry. You can go ahead. No, no, absolutely. Thank you. Um, and um, last but not least, uh, there are other areas of sustainability, uh, specialized kind of financing. For instance, in this part of the world, uh, the Middle East follows Islam uh, as a majority religion. And uh, hence, there is Sharia compliant financing that happens in general. I think a very interesting space for for trade tech to explore. I mean, I might be mistaken. I haven't I haven't seen one yet myself. But a trade tech that involves uh, Sharia compliance or Islamic finance, because Islamic finance um, as as a principle is about doing the right thing. It's about, uh, you know, no frauds, not investing in in in, in uh, harmful industries, not doing something harmful to the to the environment, etc. So it ties in well with sustainability and ESG. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, I mean, you you were referring to something very interesting, by the way, earlier, mm-hmm. and two things stroke my attention massively. Uh, First thing, we, you you were talking, you were referring to what to what was to what's going on. You say in UK and how this is going to invest massively the international trade because of the common law. Yes. We know that these solutions, digital solutions, are all based on the Lisa, how they call them in UK. It's yes. still adoption, still largely lagging behind worldwide. But the very first countries to adopt were. Singapore was Bahrain actually the first one. Yes. How this is this is being received actually in Middle East to start from Dubai to start from Bahrain. Any differences? How this this is going to impact the trade in in the region? I would love to have your insights into this. Oh sure. Uh, like you rightly said, uh, this little small country over here, Bahrain, as small as it is, and uh, I was fortunate to have lived in it for for a year. It has a 1.4 million uh, population, but it is one of the uh, front runners and troopers when it comes to uh, regulation for open banking conducive to uh, all things digital. So they were, in fact, the first country in the world to adopt Militar globally in 2018, after Yusitral had it out uh, in 2017. Um, Not Too far off later, the UAE under the ADGM, which is the Abu Dhabi Global Markets uh, Authority, they've also adopted Militer. And in fact, they were among the participants of the first digital trade finance pilot for cross-border jurisdictions that have a harmony and have adopted Militer, like you've rightly mentioned, Andrea, Singapore. And the banks that were involved with this were Emirates uh, NBD, I believe, and and, uh, Standard Charter, to to name a few. so uh, I think I think uh, generally uh, the countries in the Middle East, even if they didn't say in verbatim that they have adopted Militar, like the two examples I have I have mentioned, they are either on the way because a lot of them have histories that date back to you know uh, the UK and France. Both of these jurisdictions are uh, are adopting Militar in a sense, and then the other and the and the other area as well is that they all have legislation or law that talks about electronic documents so even if it's not the word that we know as militer it is just one layer away from that and then i remember the implementation of cargo x in egypt and customs yes that was one of the first examples where we saw exactly trade facilitation digitization and blockchain right and so what egypt come on no right It's not yes. the US, it's not uh, Europe, it's not one of those countries. It's Europe, and let me, t- Egypt, let me tell you, by the way, I-, I had an exchange maybe with a common acquaintance of ours, Sarah Mohammed El Nagar, a while back in time. Mm-hmm. And he told me, look, this is pretty serious stuff. If you don't comply with a single window here in Italy, every cargo yes. that does not comply with it is going to be sent back. Mm-hmm. So that's yeah. a giant step ahead. I mean, it was. Realize. And it's no surprise that this comes from Egypt, which is, by the way, Middle East, rather than strictly Africa. We know what we're talking about because we know how the culture in the country is. 
one more thing, Sarah, you were referring to earlier, and I'm deeply interested in too. Uh, we'd love to have your take into this. You were referring to being inclusive. And this, if yes. you remember the first time we talked, we started talking, we, we agreed on one fact. Trade nowadays largely uninclusive, small and, me and medium enterprise, not to mention the micro enterprises. How can blockchain step into the picture as an enabler for those micro, small, medium enterprises to en enable them to get their own way into the larger picture in international trade? Um, um, is it enough blockchain or do we have something more in place to, to let this happen? I mean, from the example we see, I think that's a very good question. I see, for instance, the example of uh, UAE Trade Connect in the UAE. I think they're doing a fantastic job um, with blockchain. It's a, blo it's a blockchain-based solution. Uh, they've already uh, looked into invoices, I think, north of 100 uh, billion dirhams. Um, and I think it's between two things. You want to create this element of trust that there is no double dipping, because I think that's the main um trust issue that that you would have with a new player are they invoicing me and are they going to somebody else as well and then asking for the same discounting on the same invoice yes or no because if i if i think about it this way actually let me take a step back so there is in the uae which is not really related to trade per se it's more all encompassing there's something called the al ittihad credit bureau aecb which is a credit bureau which looks at everything from a retail person like me who probably took a loan all the way to a large corporate who has trade finance limits regular short term loans and etc and the whole idea of the AECB is to make sure that you're not financing a loan with another loan i'm not getting a credit card on a retail level from one bank and paying my other credit card through a credit card and same with banks. So you have this visibility. And I think these are areas because, you know, when we were talking about examples of trade tech where bank consortiums didn't work out, uh, it's not for every use case that it's not going to work out. In this use case, there is an it for, you know, what's in it for me, for everyone, which is I want to make sure this didn't get financed somewhere else. And the only way I could do this is to be in a consortium led uh, blockchain and they do have a steering committee that meets periodically to ensure that you know they're they're um, either enhancing their solution uh, but there's obviously other things that are plugged in it's not just blockchain it's also machine learning for instance they keep on looking at uh, learning about the the kind of invoices that come into into uh, into the system there's also uh, OCR optical character recognition that also comes into play. So uh, the blockchain may be the main, let's say, uh, leading technology, but obviously it's not in silos. There are other, other areas that enable. Love this, especially you see the reference to silos. And that's maybe what the ESG does, is breaking the silos in a very yes. harmonic way. Uh, guys, if you have some questions, don't hesitate to, to step in the picture, especially you, Bob, if you want to. To get deeper into this, you feel free to 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 start. Uh, please, Sarah, if you if you want to go ahead with the, with the talks with the, with the more insights, as you know, you you have more sure. slides to show. Sure. No, I just wanted to echo something that Eric mentioned with regards to uh, Egypt and Cargo X because I still remember like it were yesterday when I saw the news and I was like, wow, my country out of all countries, one of the first to do because. Even myself, you know, yeah, <laughs> kudos indeed. I, I, I would have thought, you know, some other market would have done it, to be honest. And to see uh, that, you know, uh, advanced cargo info or ACI is being done on blockchain and that it's mandatory. But at the same time, I kind of also understand why Egypt would do this, because you want to make sure that there are no smuggled goods that are coming into the country. You want to make sure that there are no dangerous shipments that come into the country also a level of control of what kind of goods go in because the whole idea of the currency controls versus uh, imports that go into the country as well and how they're bought and how they're sourced. So I think it was in the government's prerogative um, to do this, but it was, it was, yeah, it was definitely something that I was proud to read. So yeah. As you should, as you should. <laughs> Thanks. Um, the other ones uh, that I'll also glance quickly upon is uh, 
to finish off with uh, on the UAE points is uh, they created the very first independent virtual asset regulatory authority. So it's called VARA. It's in Dubai and it was established in 2021. And the way they define a virtual asset, because they're the ones that actually give permits or licenses to any uh, uh, virtual asset provider, uh, except those that are based in the DIFC or the Dubai International Financial Center, because they have a separate authority. So they have a very all encompassing definition of virtual assets. So it doesn't just include crypto, but it also includes uh, tokens uh, and, 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 and other digital forms of assets. So one day, maybe who knows, maybe the electronic bill of lading could be something or negotiable instruments could be something that is involved in their definition as well. Um, last but not least, Saudi Arabia. Uh, when we when we will talk about uh, you know, we trade and trade lens and all these other trade techs where there was a mismatch between deployment and the success rates of, you know, these, these trade techs and the funding when it dried, dried out for some of them, it wasn't for all the cases. Um, Saudi Arabia now is the Mecca. It's not just a pilgrimage place from a religious standpoint, but it's also now becoming the Mecca for, for trade and tech in general, whether it's metaverse initiatives, whether it's, uh, uh, gaming even, uh, they're, they're very interested on, on the trade front and they actually said that they're uh, unveiling a $1.2 billion package for tech initiatives. So if you're a tech uh, or a trade tech founder, I think this is a place that you need to consider because the, the government is willing to deploy money there. You mentioned um, the Sharia law, uh, trade finance solution. There we go. There's there your we financing go. right there, right? That's the right place to do it. Absolutely. Um, and then last but not least, uh, this year in different phases, there is a B2B mandatory use uh, of electronic invoicing system, which is called Fatura, which is actually the Arabic word for invoice. In fact, it's very interesting. Like in Egypt, they call it nefeza, which is uh, window Feza. when they were talking about the window. <laughs> exactly. So it's always an Arabic word that's used. Uh, and by the way, um, in, it's, in Italian, it's Fatura. So it's pretty similar. Fatura. You know, oh, there we go. Exactly. There yeah. we go. Francesi, <laughs> Fatura. <laughs> fatura. So you see how yes. entwined we are, by the way, traditionally. Exactly. 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 So that's, that's uh, a bit on the Middle East, but um, besides uh, digital, I think uh, you also had questions, Andrea, Bob, maybe, and Eric, on the sustainability side of things, and you know, maybe a question about uh, being a very oil and gas based uh, kind of region. How how are we doing there? Maybe. Absolutely, that's a, yeah. Indeed, <laughs> because there, there is a huge oil. amount. There's a huge amount of money available because of the oil and the gas industry, but they have yeah. also invested a lot in solar panels and uh liquid uh Good nitrogen way. uh hydrogen etc so i'm very curious alternative what... energies renewables and yeah. it's a matter yeah. of fact that sustainability is under everybody's lens in the region because temperature is rising so i read that if you do not nothing in in a very few years the region is going to be all inhabited so i'll leave it on to you to reframe a little on what's going on in there sure so essentially, yes, this part of the world has been for a long time, their GDP was based out of uh, oil and gas. We're obviously trying to, to, to try to, to, to get away from, from oil and gas and try to diversify into other areas of, of uh, GDP. So in the UAE, they're fully focused on tourism, transport, so air transport, uh, and, and, and other areas of re-exports, for instance, of regular, of regular goods. And this is very important when it comes to banks and financiers as well, because the whole idea of stranded assets, what if I am deploying loans for a certain project today, that tomorrow this asset is not of the same value tomorrow because, um, you know, uh, because of sustainability policies or whatnot, we cannot, we cannot finance this anymore. So we do see banks right now, they are having uh, disclosures of uh, equator principal reports, the TCFD, uh, reports and I think the, the the main one that spearheads this is is actually Fab First Abu Dhabi Bank. They're very 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 uh, advanced when it comes to their disclosures in this, um, and we do see how they show their their loan book and they try to show you how they're doing it by 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 sector and how they're actually trying to reduce from the oil and gas sector and going into other areas. It's very interesting that you also mention um, the whole idea of renewable energy because a lot of the uh, countries have actually revised their NDCs 
their, their, their contributions to the SDGs by trying to go into more renewable mix, trying to go into net zero, because a lot of the countries here in the beginning did not pledge to net zero. And this comes at a very opportune time, because as I'm sure you'd recall, the UAE just uh, hosted COP, uh, sorry, Egypt, my country, hosted COP last year, and uh, UAE is about to host COP uh, this year, COP28. And I, I and I can't wait for that to hear and what's what's going to be told during that event. By the way. Oh yes, yes. No, that's going to be insightful. It's going to be exciting. Yeah, yeah. So that that's great, Sarah. Uh, we refer May I interrupt you, uh, Andrea? No, no. Because go ahead. Go ahead Sarah, Bob. do you actually um, see the influence of the rules and regulations which are now currently uh, passing on in uh, European Union that that it has also an effect? in your region because that was basically the idea you start somewhere and because of the global supply chain you're connected somehow that actually at the end it will be beneficial for the rest of the world as well do you, do you see some effects on that do you mean from a taxonomy perspective uh, yeah. of sustainability yes yes we do in fact uh here in the uae they're building their own uh taxonomy as well they are basing it out of the eu one they obviously say there's no point to reinvent the wheel but every country will do as it sees fit to its uh uh um uh, you know, uh, regional uh, national goals. ambitions yeah. and regional requirements, etc. Exactly, because there is no one size fits all approach in this. But obviously, the goal is to uh, decarbonize, uh, go into more uh, sustainable renewable energies uh, versus uh, fossil fuels. So that's 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 a given. And in fact, um, the UAE, especially, and also Egypt, like my mother is from Alexandria, the Mediterranean. So that's something probably we share, Andrea, as well. Uh, a lot of the shorelines now are 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 highly affected because of the ra raising sea, rising sea levels. So this is something that's becoming a prerogative of a lot of these countries because they're vulnerable to uh, rising seawater levels. Uh, so in fact, this was one of the main environmental risks for the UAE and Egypt. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. You mentioned, uh, Sarah, uh, a big focus on the E of ESG. How about the S in ESG? Yes, there are a lot of, uh, I mean, I'll speak because I'm a woman, so <laughs> allow me this. Allow me this time. I was very proud to see the UAE. They have a lot of they have a lot of initiatives that they put in place to 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 help women. So one of the things is that uh, for for listed companies, there is actually a quota of what are the board members required for women of stock listed companies here in the UAE. Uh, the UAE uh, climate change minister is actually a, a woman, the newly appointed one. Um, the uh, uh, there was actually one of the private sector retail companies uh, here in, in in the Middle East that said that they are actually going to deploy uh, money for funding for uh, coding lessons for women to become coders. So there's a lot of push for women empowerment because one of the things that we've read, you know, from COVID is that. Uh, women are actually more affected in this whole uh, digital literacy gap than men, uh, and also loss of jobs and all of these uh, areas. In fact, women are more are more uh, impacted than men from a lot of studies. Um, so it's very good to see that this region, which usually I would understand maybe from the outside world, would have not expected this kind of uh, uh, support towards women. But it's 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 fantastic what's going on. Also in Egypt, you'd see a lot of the main ministers. Uh, the one of economic development, for instance, uh, is also a woman. Uh, investment also also a woman. So it's it's uh, no, it's it's definitely high time in the Middle East. If uh, if you're a woman, you're in the right place. It's awesome to hear. Yes. And also, in fact, one of the other areas, like for instance, that that concern me in my day to day, is that. Uh, Abu Dhabi and Dubai are among the safest uh, uh, cities in the world uh, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, crime rates are low, uh, stability, etc. So, so as as a woman or as a human being, it's not something that I, I have to think about in my day to day. And that was true a long time ago because I was in Dubai uh, twenty plus years ago, my one and only time, unfortunately. And I was told even back then that it was a very safe place to be. You'd walk yeah. around, uh, you know, the souks, the market, and uh, you felt safe. You just, you just. Exactly. Felt, right? uh, Sarah, you, should, you I, should come again, Eric. 
All of you I actually would should come for a visit. You. I'm sure it's <laughs> changed a whole lot in the last 20 years. Oh, yeah, yeah I, I guess it's no longer the same country, the same city. I mm-hmm. mean, I was there 12 years ago, and I guess... Oh, I wow. The same okay, thing. no. You're in for a surprise. <laughs> yeah. Sarah, uh, you refer to something really interesting because Bob and I, we, we've been talking about this. You refer to tokens. You refer maybe to digital native business models, business instruments and their proximity to real life economy and the new form yes. of participation, how this matches in a trade space with Islamic finance. And we know it's pretty particular. So, I mean, how this is going to be developed further on, you mentioned Trade Tech, a company with a queue that is good, yes. has formed this security token. Um, how this is going to be impactful because we were thinking that digital transformation is such a long, long process. So maybe we should mm-hmm. be focusing more and more in digitally native instruments and business model. What's your mm-hmm. take into this, Sarah? That's an interesting topic. First of all, just to <laughs> just to be very clear, I'm not an Islamic scholar, so there's always a Sharia board that always looks into this and gets a fatwa or an edict out. So just yeah, to, just to first put this out there, no, no, but to just what? give my view. Obviously, with with uh, with this, there 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 are there are two views. One would be the fear of the technology itself, and one that would be no, I'm a proponent of this because um, there is actually more transparency. There is actually less. Uh, ability uh, for fraud. There is more, uh, let's say, uh, when one holds a token, it understands how much do I have of what invoice, for instance, when we're talking about the trade asset distribution piece, for instance, in 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 uh, in trade. Um, I think, from a Sharia perspective, the the same the same principles still hold. Uh, are you are you uh, investing in a respectful industry? Are you not taking uh, riba or or interest on an on an investment? The same the same would hold true as you would have in your regular, uh, uh, you know, Sharia compliant or Islamic uh, finance, as you would with a tr- uh, with a tech spin on it if 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 i dare say it that way so i don't i don't see that necessarily how it's how we do things that are different but the principles and the ideologies don't change if that makes sense very nice yeah in fact even the risk appetite should be even more uh uh let's say positive i would say because to the point you said we're in you were investing in the real economy you're not investing in something that's not tangible that's not understood you're not investing in a mm-hmm. in a stock you're not so i think i think in a way in fact it's it's actually going to support this uh, going deeper into this sarah we're talking about blockchain we're talking about data mm-hmm. actually data governance and stuff like this first thing i wanted to know how can all this massive data be utilized for generating this new sort of assets in the end of the day, ESG has a deeper understanding into how things are being done under the three letters. Um, mm-hmm. How can this data be utilized in the future to generate more, more facilities, more facilities backing up trade in general? Because sure, we, we that... know that uh, <laughs> traditional instruments what stands is the financial side. There's nothing bad about this. But mm-hmm. if you want to include small companies, mm-hmm. which has no certified balance sheets, how can ASG step into the picture or SDG step into the picture to enable these companies? And we, we go back to the beginning, by the way. Mm-hmm. Yes. How can this new framework cooperate with blockchain to enable these micro and small companies to step into the larger picture. Right. Some of the ideas that are out there is actually tokenization. So for instance, if there is, uh, you know, like there are these uh, uh, certificate of origins, for instance, where if this gets tokenized and then it shows that, okay, this good came from this and this place, it, it, it was probably, uh, let's say if we're talking about a shirt, the cotton was done in a, in an ESG uh, friendly way. The mo- most important thing, I think, when it comes to uh, trade tech and blockchain in general, is don't reinvent the wheel where you don't need to. You do have ESG second party opinion and raters out there. What you need to do is create a network for these different industry 
assessors because you're not going to be an industrialist right for everything from the cotton to the steel to to everything else so you need you need to have those in your ecosystem in the blockchain or originating these certificate these original uh, electronic versions of the certificate of origins it can get tokenized it can actually go to a bank for uh, against you know money or for to a financier against money that look I have these things coming up your way. These things have been sustainably sourced. Look at my certificate of origin. I'm 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 well rated, and it's a win-win for you, financier, because you want to show that you've deployed a sustainable uh, transaction or financing towards a sustainable transaction. So all parties win. And in fact, there could also be a revenue share model with these uh, uh, authenticators or these uh, uh, certificate uh, or ESG credential authenticators. I particularly love this, uh, Sarah. I really love this basic fact that you mentioned ecosystems instead of platforms, mm. single platforms. Yes. And Bob <laughs> can tell you more. We that's were the cardinal story. rule. <laughs> exactly. So maybe Bob has yes. something to share in terms of thoughts about this as well. Uh, I have always many thoughts, but I'm a bit blank today, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> no, but one of the things what you mentioned is like uh, what I notice a lot with ESG is that it's always from a company perspective. And now you were talking about the supply chain. That is something which to me feels like there is a conflict. How do you think that is going to evolve in the future? Because for that, you call also an ecosystem, which is a very uh, difficult topic. Uh, how how can we actually flourish much more in that perspective? Do you have an name? Sure, I think there's... That? Mm. I think there is a, a, a push and pull in this reason being some corporates in the supply chain benefit when you don't know who is their original supplier, if you're an intermediary. So you probably don't want to go on a blockchain and say, oh, okay, I source my flowers from that person in Kenya and I get this from this place and, and some other place. So I think there's going to be a push and pull in that. But at the same time, if you're an SME and you're vulnerable and you really need to, to, to have working capital flowing, you need to be able to... to pay for more produce and just have that, you know, that, that, that wheel going, then um, I think, I think it's important to say, okay, here is, here's my information. Here is my data. It could go in one of ways. It could go probably invoice factoring, for instance, is one area for, for instance, in Africa, they look at invoice factoring a lot. Another way is if you are probably a level one or level two or three supplier in a supply chain for a big multinational corporate buyer, then you can have a proper uh, supply chain finance anchoring the buyer risk and getting a, a form of discount that you wouldn't have had as a standalone SME. You're trying to get the benefit of, of, of the buyer. And at the same time, the buyer is, is, is benefiting out of this because um, he, the buyer is giving benefits to its entire uh, supply chain, for instance. And at the same time, it's, 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 it's also benefiting from their working capital uh, benefits. So instead of paying now, I pay later. Uh, I, I maybe I don't know how auditors look at it, but an off balance sheet treatment of 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 what I owe, etc. Um, so I think it will come to a point where what's more important, uh, uh, disclosure or sustainability, at at some point. And I think the two go hand in hand, right? There, there's an mm. evolution to this whole conversation. We're starting yes. from pretty much zero, if you ask me. And yeah, yes. we'll we'll have that evolution from disclosure. We, we're not counting. We're not measuring everything right now. So we'll have these little baby steps of what we'll be monitoring and, and recording and measuring and eventually improving, which will lead us to the overall goal of being actually sustainable because... I don't think, and again, you mentioned you're not uh, you're not a scholar. Yeah, I'm not an expert in environmental issues, but I know that we're not sustainable today, and, and uh, we have a long way to go. But if we start measuring using great tools like this, um, at least we'll have a better understanding of what we need to do next, which will eventually lead us to being more sustainable. Exactly. And, the, and I think, mm -hmm, sorry. Sorry, uh, no, sorry to interrupt you, uh, Sarah, but I think Eric has a good point there that I think it starts with mm -hmm. regulations. Basically, we have to be yes. compliant and show it. 
not only because of rules and regulations, because of you, we as an end consumer would like to see more and mm -hmm. more on it. So that requires yeah. all those parties to collaborate much more together. And the moment yes. you start collaborating more and want to actually improve it as well, you start investing in each other. Not only from Agreed. a working capital perspective, but also knowledge, technology, et cetera. So Neon will all benefit okay. from it and have a better sustainability uh, over the, in the long run as well. So I think that is yeah the push. It's actually that we're trying to, uh, to create forward with the help of all these rules and regulations. So hopefully we, uh, we achieve that very quickly. I full heartedly agree. I just think that there needs to be a harmonization of the standards, you know, between uh, SASB and the other standards. And they are coming, like, you know, like you would have your GAP and your uh, IFRS in, ter in terms of financial accounting, they also need to come to a harmonized, uh, uh, let's say, uh, standardization of how we measure things. So mm -hmm. uh, it, it's 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 more of a difficult, I think, subject to to be able to. It's not numbers. It's not uh, it's not your balance sheet. It's not your income statement. It's a, a different way of looking at it. But uh, I think at some point when that when this harmonization is is reached then we will have a better, uh, let's say, or an optimal language of how we talk about uh, sustainability and um, comparing one company to the other or one uh, stakeholder to the other. And they're talking about product passports already in Europe. Exactly. That, batteries, that's right? exactly what I wanted to have, the famous digital passport products. Mm. Uh, yeah. I, I had several conversations about this recently. Uh, I have my, one more question, Sarah, for you just... Mm -hmm. Uh, since the discussion is going pretty well, you know, and I wanted to have your input into this. See, we, we're starting to see digitalization of trade. Uh, the traditional stakeholders, namely banks, we're mm -hmm. witnessing uh, a deep mutation transformation from uh, traditional banking to, work, in my opinion, a mere technical supplier. Look at that, what's going on, especially in the UK. Look at what's mm. allowed by the URDTT. And we were mm. discussing this, by the way, last year with David Menel and Chris Southworth at BSEA. Sure. You see that traditional stakeholders, banks are no longer the only stakeholders into this. But if you want to come up with real inclusion, and we were talking about inclusion, you have to let in other stakeholders and providers, by the way. So trade tax, yes. tokens. This new freight awareness, boom, that's yes. a very good match uh, about this, this new uh, stakeholders in the trade, by the way. So how do you see this coming up in the future, especially uh, the holy grail coming up soon, you see, with approval of the electronic trade bill in the UK? Yes, yes. What do no, I think... I think that's a very good question. In fact, the one thing I'd like to I'd like to uh, highlight when it comes to trade tech is that the main pain point was only regulation. It was never the technology. And this is a perfect time for trade tech companies to flourish because if you see here from the World Economic Forum uh, and also from another survey from, from Trade Finance Global and the World Trade Organization, it was legal challenges, it was regulation. And that's not hopefully with all what we just discussed is no longer going to be the case. A lot of the trade techs, unfortunately, that that didn't make, you know, post 2022 or just recently 2023 was because they were incepted in 2016 and 2017. And then there was this holdup during the COVID year and whatnot after. So it wasn't, let's say that the best of times to be a, a, a trade tech in, in that in that regard. But I think the main area is to learn from the downfalls of the others and 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 looking in the future is, are you ready right now? Do you have the idea? When we were just talking about Saudi Arabia deploying uh, into, into tech space, look at the governments, okay, that, that, that want to take this up. Look at other financiers. You don't have to go into a consortium and struggle with consensus as we've seen for some use cases that was not the optimal uh, uh, way of doing things. Uh, also, unfortunately, with some of these consortiums, they feel that one or two players in that consortium benefit more than the others, or the others don't, uh, you know, uh, build the case as fast or bring their clients uh, Their Banks typically have a very arm's length approach when it comes. Uh, the so-called famous and infamous lion's share, if you can call it. Yes, so yes, that, the that lion's share. Exactly. Waste everything. Exactly. 
Exactly. And then some of the other ideas that are also coming into play in trade tech space or tech space in general is not just the trade tech solution, but when you have a lot of these digital islands, how do they talk to each other? How are they interoperable? Who is creating the bridges? So for sometimes you even have to forget about the use case. How do I make this uh, network and this network talk to each other? Because you're only uh, you're only going to be able to scale as much as your network is able to bootstrap and bring uh, like you've mentioned, all those uh, players in the in the ecosystem on from the logistics to the regulators, to the financiers, to the asset uh, trade distribution, et cetera. So from origination all the way to distribution. So uh, some some trade techs or tech founders have to think about the bridge between public and private and whatnot. So that's that's another area to look at. Um, and I think I probably just went uh, a few steps ahead, but the first and foremost question, if you're talking about, say, a blockchain-based trade tech is, what are you solving? Is it necessary? Or is it just the hype that is making you say, you know what, I'm going to insert blockchain between those parties? You always have to think about, uh, they say, not the not the use case, but the case study. I think there's a lot of... Um, euphoria with the idea that, oh, blockchain can do this and blockchain can do that. And what you have seen with a lot of unfortunate uh, cases in trade tech that didn't make it was they spread themselves too thin. They went into new product to new product. Oh, this blockchain can do this, can do this, can do that, and never went into full maturity and full deployment with the bread and better, butter product that was there in, in inception, in ideation. So the whole, the, the whole, um, thing that should be seen in white papers or if you're going to investors is what is my base of cost? What is what is regulatory cost as well that I have? Operational cost that I have? What is the kind of talent that I employ into the trade tech? Are they multifaceted? Yes or no? Um, uh, what am I trying to solve? What, what are other competitors that are out there? Typical business model as you would a, 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 you know, a mom and pop shop in your white paper. Because this is how you you uh, show investors that you've done your homework. And that's the other thing when it comes to longevity of funding. Are you only based on, on banks funding? Are you only based on the big two large corporates that are uh, in the ideation phase? No, uh, we need to go beyond venture capital and private equity. We have to look into angel investors. And as I've mentioned, government investors as well to help with your product. So I think... I think that's important. Also understanding the kind of shareholders that you attract. Are they the ones that want to make a quick buck? Are they here for fast return on investments? I don't really care if this is a game uh, changing uh, thing for the industry, yes or no. And we have seen this happen. We have seen cases of trade techs that didn't make it, not because the solution didn't work, not because they didn't scale well, but because one of the founders said, you know what, it's not it's not making the money I want it to make. So I think a lot of this is very important to, to, to bear in mind when, when one goes into this, but this is a perfect time to consider trade tech for sure. I think you summarize very well what we have been discussing the last <laughs> couple of, uh, of meetings and in, indeed it is <laughs> the right consortia, the right, the right representatives in the ecosystem, creating value for everybody. Of course, solving yes. the problem, you have to yes. bring value at least to one, preferably all, which are in the ecosystem you're mm -hmm. serving. And yeah, who's actually giving you the money in order to uh, to flourish? And are they looking for a short-term investment and a quick ROI or for a long-term? And I think those are exactly very nice points, which actually mm -hmm. have been failing a few of the examples we are very well aware of. Next week, that some of them made it. businesses are not looking at valuation and, and stock prices and uh, investor relations, right? So your, your small and medium sized businesses are looking at that return on investment immediately exactly. mm -hmm. to stay alive. Yeah, absolutely. I really In fact, I read it. somewhere that it even encourages to do non for profit as a model, at least in the mm -hmm. initial years. So unless a, a shareholder is not going to, you know, uh, be on the same page on this, then then there's a problem. Yeah, you have to Sorry, have a good Andrea. understanding of the same goal. And exactly also this business yeah. model is very important. And also if you're yeah. separate or you're still a long arm of the original company mm -hmm. or companies, so their branding becomes also an issue. 
yeah, so, yeah that's yeah. a very good point that's a very good point yeah so what would be the main takeaways from uh, exactly from all this? you you just said it before me eric <laughs> to finalize let's keep what? the message three times already i beat you to the punch uh, today <laughs> Okay. I, I need to. Oh, I need no, to admit that today I. I. I made. It. I, I. I'm. I'm one. You see, defeated me, Sarah. <laughs> Please come to my help and rescue me. You see, <laughs> nasty guy. Well, if, yeah. If I were, if I were to put all this together, uh, as I've mentioned, this is this is a, an opportune time to go into the trade tech landscape, especially if you're looking into DLT with all that's happening on the electronic bill of lading, the whole idea of ownership of a digital asset being you know, transferred from party to party. This is not digital like PDF uh, version copies. No, this is this is actual ownership uh, transfer. And if we look at the ecosystem here for 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 trade tech, not all trade texts that are based on DLT should be treated the same way, meaning that some of some of the use cases here or nature of them do not need to depend on regulation to succeed in scaling. For instance, the KYC element, the marketplace uh, insurance, what have you. They didn't need Militer or whatnot to 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 advance in 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 their business case, but. When it comes to trade finance, when it comes to uh, when it comes to the logistics and supply chain finance uh, areas, this is this is the place where yes, this was this was the part of trade tech that was very 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 vulnerable. That if you did not have a regulation that supported uh, uh, electronic bill of lading, that supported regulation being harmonized across the world, then you might find it very difficult to to scale. And I think that's why, um, by the indication of the few X's here uh, on this uh, ecosystem, you would find that these uh, uh, trade techs that didn't make it were the ones that actually come from these subdivisions of of uh, of uh, you know the ones that are that are that are uh, uh, needing the regulation to push forward. So I think, in a nutshell, this is a good time because the regulation is is getting there. Uh, the maritime industry is is certainly getting there. Uh, if you're going to add uh, other areas like we've mentioned, Islamic and ESG and whatnot, this is actually a very good time to do so. We talked about the Middle East. We showed that there are already blockchain initiatives that are out there, whether it was in Egypt, in UAE, uh, whether it was Bahrain being always in the forefront and, and conducive regulations for open banking. Um, this is this is the place to be. So uh, just wow. make sure you do it right. That's that's that, that's, that's amazing, uh, amazing <laughs> content you've delivered. I like it very much, Sarah. I like it very Thank much. Thanks. Perfect. I think we can thank close you. the meeting, and uh, Eric. And can only thank you, Sarah, for this. I mean, for oh, being with I, us. Thank uh, you. That was thank a, you. indeed yeah, a great, great talk. Chat. Thank you very much. Love this slide, by the way. <laughs> yep. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. No, thank you so much, everyone. And thank you for your time. And thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. And I really enjoyed the discussion. So, um, yeah. And let's keep going. I'm sure we'll talking. meet in person. Oh, inshallah. Inshallah. <laughs> inshallah. <laughs>